in Uncracked and Cracked Beams. He is a PhD candidate at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and his background lies in construction material science, working with different types of concrete mixture designs, reinforced concrete durability problems, and rehab rehabilitation of structures. He's currently doing research on the durability and corrosion performance of advanced reinforced concrete systems for transportation infrastructure. Different types of ductile concrete systems and alternative reinforcement are being investigated in terms of corrosion performance, freeze thaw resistance, salt scaling, drying shrinkage, and mechanical properties. The project's outcome will help to increase the service life of transportation and infrastructure. So with that, I'll introduce... Thank you, Ryan. Hello, everyone. My name is Sayed Masukshir Horshidi. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the New Jersey Institute of Technology a few, uh, few months back from graduation. My today's presentation is about corrosion performance of ortho performance concrete in uncracked and cracked beams. This is a part of a bigger project uh, funded by New Jersey Department of Transportation for investigating the corrosion behavior and durability of ductile concrete systems and alternative reinforcement for increasing the service life and using in uh, transportation inf infrastructures. For today's presentation, actually, I'm going to provide some introductory and background information on this project, and then <clears throat> we jump into your lab. I should provide you some slides about what did we did uh, with UHPC in the lab, and then present some of the results briefly. So. Introduction and background information. Uh, corrosion is one of the main durability problems in uh, reinforced concrete systems. Chlorides uh, in deicing salts and uh, sea, wa sea water can uh, penetrate into the concrete and reach to the repair surface. And when they reach to a certain level of concentration, they can break the passive layer on the rebar and initiate the corrosion. Uh, the corrosion products are expensive materials and can impose stress on the concrete and create cracks. These cracks can propagate and finally cause uh, uh, spalling of concrete. And it exposes rebar, more rebar to the chloride, so we have more corrosion, more damage, loss of capacity, and uh, more corrosion. Ductile concrete systems can be one of the potential solutions for. Uh, increasing the service life of uh, reinforced concrete systems. Uh, here you can see an overview of tensile behavior of three types of ductile concrete systems compared to uh, ordinary concrete. Uh, in this study, we specifically focus on three types of ductile concrete systems, ultra performance concrete or UHPC, engineered cementitious composites or ECC, and hybrid fiber reinforced concrete or HIFRC. And you can see an overview of the tensile behavior compared to these materials and ordinary concrete. One of the main differences between these materials and ordinary concrete is the cracking behavior. So uh, in tension and in flexure, if you have a big crack in the normal concrete, it propagates, the crack width increases, and then we have the failure. In the ductile concrete systems, instead of one big crack, we have multiple micro cracks after a certain threshold of crack widths. For example, for ECC 0.6 micrometer, uh, instead of just increasing the crack widths, other cracks and micro cracks in different parts of the system propagate. And uh, this is the main behavior that these systems have with the uh, normal concrete systems. Also, I have summarize some of the mechanical properties of these uh, ductile concrete systems, uh, compressive behavior and uh, compressive strength and uh, tensile uh, stress and strain. Uh, because of different cracking behavior, these materials generally do not spall and uh, retain residual strength in compression. Here we can see an overview of the uh, different mixture designs of uh, concrete systems. Uh, the first one is ultra performance concrete. In these systems, we used binder, uh, including cement and SEMs like uh, silica film, ground quartz, very fine graded sand, and uh, water and admixtures. Uh, usually, we use like super plasticizer and accelerators in some UHPCs and uh, short steel fibers. In ECC or engineered cementitious composites, we use uh, binders, including cement and mostly fly ash. 
uh, very fine graded sand and uh, water and admixtures and admixtures are usually super plasticizers and viscosity modifying agents and polymeric fibers and in hybrid fiber reinforced concrete which is kind of similar to the normal concrete we have both fine and coarse aggregate kind of like the normal concrete we have the cements and supplementary cementitious materials like fly ash also both type of steel and pva fibers uh, from uh, the cost point we can say the uhpc is the most expensive material between these three and higher forest is the cheapest one because it, it has kind of similar mixture designs to normal concrete as well as fibers in this slide, you can see the testing method that we use for investigating the corrosion behavior of uh, these concrete systems. Uh, this ten, these tests were performed according to ASTM G109 test method, which is an accelerated corrosion test because of wetting and drying cycles. Uh, we use 30% uh, salt solution, like most of free waters. Uh, for this test, we have a beam that the dimensions are 11 inches by 6 inches by uh, four and a half. Uh, we have two layers of uh, rebar, two bars at the bottom and one bar at the top. The top bar is meant to be the anode and we see the corrosion at the top bar. And the bottom bars are meant to be at cutted. We connect these two layers of bars with the resistor together. And we pound the specimen from the top with the three person salt solution and do the wetting and drying cycles every two weeks. The corrosion measurements will be by measuring the corrosion current density and corrosion potentials and also to see the effect of cracking behavior between ductile concrete systems and normal systems. Uh, actually, we use two mixes from New Jersey Department of Transportation. Uh, we made cracks in three-point bending. Uh, in the samples, we loaded all the specimens up to 80% of the capacity to see how cracks you know, work and affect the corrosion behavior. This is kind of the uh, test, uh, testing plan and uh, kind of casting plan for uh, this research for corrosion part. We have five different uh, concrete systems. Three of them are ductile concrete system and two mixes from New Jersey Department of Transportation that they use in the projects. One of them is self-consolidating class P and the other one is high performance concrete. Uh, also, we tested different types of rebar, black bar, epoxy coated rebar in both damaged and undamaged state to see the effect of uh, some damage in transportation and casting MF MMFX or chromix bars, galvanized bars and stainless steel. Uh, some of these systems were tested in, <coughs> in both uncracked and cracked beam and some of them just uncracked beam to compare the results. So this was just kind of an overview of what we did in, in this project for NGDOT. We had also some durability tests that I'm not going to you know, talk in details about those. So uh, in the next part, I just want to go and provide some kind of introductory information about UHPC and castings we have in the lab. <clears throat> so a typical mixing procedure for UHPC is first dry mixing all the uh, solid materials we have and then adding the uh, water and admixtures. Uh, we wait until we get a, a paste and then we add the fibers and discharge the mix. I have a couple of videos for you here. Uh, so the first stage is The powder mixing, we mix the uh, powder for two minutes and add the water. If you see the timer, it's like around nine minutes. Uh, these materials are almost mixing for seven minutes here with water and the thing we see is still powder. Uh, I, can, I can remember for the first time that I was casting these materials and I was you know, mixing UHPC. Uh, we added all the dry materials and water and basically nothing happened. Uh, we waited like eight, nine minutes and it was like just powder is mixing. Uh, I suppose it was very first time I was mixing the UHPC. I suppose, okay, probably something's wrong. Wanted to call someone and ask if something's wrong that one of the undergrads was helping me said, oh, it seems something's happening. And kind of the powder was getting darker and 
you can see this thing was happening. So we saw some clamps of, uh, of this material almost in 12 or 13 minutes. It just happened in like 20 seconds or 30 seconds that it, these clamps, you know, joined together and they were kind of making a paste. And here you can see the UHPC kind of at the very end of the mixing before adding the fibers. Uh, I just stop the mixer here till you see how the material looks and how is the viscosity of the UHPC. This is the stage we add the fibers gradually and continue the mixing to get a, a homogeneous material. And finally, We run a flow test to see how this UHPC is. This is kind of a verification. The UHPC, it depends on the UHPC, different UHPCs can be different, but for this mix, and for most of them, I can say UHPC has a, um, a flow of something between eight to nine inches. And uh, this is kind of a verification that shows that materials looking good, and it's a somehow that fibers won't sink after casting. And here you can see that we got something around eight and eight and a quarter with the fibers. Also, UHPC is kind of unique material to work with in the lab. So here you can see some of our casting G109 beams uh, at the left. Uh, it is very unique material to work with, specifically in the labs, because they are really sticky, uh, and you will have a hard work to clean all the tools and the mixer. Uh, also, it gets hard kind of fast. This top surface of material gets fast pretty quickly, and you don't have you know that much of time for uh, finishing the surface. Uh, the good thing about this material is just self-consolidating, so you don't need to like vibrate or tap it that much it flows and fill all the voids in the system and after the molding as you can see at the right uh, we got a pretty good sample you know it's, uh, the surface is pretty smooth compared to other type of concrete that we cast in the lab and some of the observation and results we had in the uh, corrosion tests First of all, and this is one of the uh, high performance concretes after the loading in three, pen, three point bending. Uh, you can see the thing that I was talking about, the cracking behavior, you can see it here. Uh, we have a big crack like uh, with a 0.25 millimeters width. Uh, in the high force, the view you are looking at kind of is at the top of the dams. So basically it's kind of almost at the middle of the specimen because you know, it's just six inches compared to 11 inches of the uh, specimens. And this is just the area we pounded with salt solution. So we can see a big crack in the high performance concrete. The high performance concrete uh, had a compressive strength around uh, 8,500 PSI. And this is the cracking behavior in the UHPC. This material had a compressive strength around uh, 21,000 PSI. Uh, we loaded both system up to 80%, so it's not like we uh, load both of them at the same level. Uh, but you can see a different cracking behavior in UHPC. We have multiple uh, micro cracks uh, that basically the crack widths are less than 0.1 millimeter. According to the literature, uh, the cracks less than 0.1 millimeter kind of has very minor effect on the corrosion performance of systems. As you can see here, uh, the cracks are kind of filled with the salt. They can easily be blocked to our uh, corrosion products. Also, it limits access to the oxygen for initiation of corrosion. And this is kind of one of the, uh, uh, one of the things in ductile concrete systems that uh, improves the corrosion performance compared to normal concrete systems. This curve shows the uh, corrosion current density uh, in different you know, times. Uh, for now, it's like around 500 days that we are measuring the uh, corrosion current density in these samples between iron and cut it. Uh, you can see a blue line that is basically the threshold level for uh, corrosion current density. Whenever you know, this uh, 
measurement jumps above the line, it means we have potentially corrosion in the system. So far, after 500 days, it's nothing. That kind of makes sense because based on this test method and uh, what we have in the literature for normal concrete, it takes something between one to two years uh, to see some sign of corrosion. But uh, in UHPC, for sure, it takes more, more time. Also, we use more cover depths uh, because we needed to test uh, NGDOT mixtures that they had bigger aggregate size. So uh, we have some time, probably years, to see uh, the corrosion happening in these samples. And the last thing I want to uh, talk about is about the surface of these specimens. Uh, we can see some sign of corrosion at the surface that is basically just the corrosion of uh, steel fibers we have in the concrete. Um, it has nothing with the kind of the corrosion behavior of the rebar into the concrete. And even it can have some positive effects like uh, they can work as sacrificial anodes for actual rebar. Uh, they may affect the quality of the surface. Uh, in uh, UHPC, we did other kind of tests like salt scaling. Uh, I think it was according to ASTM C672. Uh, we just uh, did the freestyle cycles and salt scaling takes up to 50 cycles according to the standard. We saw some sign of uh, again, corrosion on the steel fibers, but it didn't affect the, the quality of surface negatively. Maybe with passing more time, it does. But uh, I just wanted to show you these pictures and say that this is nothing you know, about the corrosion in the rebar. The next uh, steps we need to take in this project is we need to continue measuring response road wearing and drying cycles. Uh, for sure, after my graduations, other students are going to measure uh, the, the, the corrosion readings in these specimens probably up to a couple of years until they uh, see some sign of corrosion. The other thing we are going to do at this step to kind of have a better idea of how these systems work is chloride profiling as a specimens. Basically, we grind the concrete in the different depths, like one millimeters, two millimeters, three millimeters, uh, up to uh, two and, uh, one and a half inch, that is the, the cover depths. And we do the chemical analysis to see the chloride content in different depths of concrete. So basically we can have some idea how the uh, chlorides are penetrating into different concrete systems. And because uh, this kind of show us how they are performing in corrosion as well, because there is a direct relationship between chloride content and corrosion initiation in, the, in these systems. So these are the two last things that we need to take for this project, and uh, that is kind of uh, what we need to do for this project. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, Uh, for this project, actually, we, we used uh, a pre-bagged mix for UHPC that they usually use for NJDOT projects, and they use uh, steel fibers. We have some kind of reactive powder concrete. It's another type of you know, UHPC or old name of UHPC without any fibers. Even I know they have recently developed some UHPCs with polymeric fibers. So those won't have this problem, but uh, it just, you know, at the very top surface and top layer of the concrete that we see that sign of corrosion, it has kind of nothing to do with, uh, with the corrosion performance of, for example, if you have, you're using that in a bridge, uh, you know, it won't affect the, the results. Uh, actually, you know, it was the, you know, uh, as I said, it was a part of a bigger project. So uh, we used those, if I go back to the very first slide, yeah. We kind of used those kind of bars with 
uh, NG DOT mixes. We didn't use them in a ductal concrete system. And the point was kind of we see, for example, using galvanized bar in, for example, HPC mix uh, from NG DOT and compared the result, for example, using with ECC or UHPC with black bars. We wanted to see which ones perform better and considering the costs and there are other aspects which ones kind of perform better by the time. For UHPC, it was 0.16. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically it has like uh, a lot of silica fume and fly ash. Uh, no, not fly ash, silica fume and ground quartz and cement and uh, very fine graded sand. I think the maximum aggregate size for sand is 0.5 millimeters. Silica fume and ground quartz. That was a pre-bagged, pre you know, uh, material uh, that we use for UHPC. We have developed some other UHPCs for another project, not this one. But I know that these materials, according to the literature, they use cement, uh, um, silica fume, and ground quartz. Other than they changed it recently. <laughs> The chemical admixtures, the superplasticizer. Actually, the, 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 the admixtures they gave us had the superplasticizer and accelerator together. And, and the ratio, I need to check. I think the rate of uh, admixture to the cement was 0 0.02 something. Yeah, something around that. Why we have better corrosion performance in these materials? Uh, these materials are, you know, finer materials compared to the cements, most of them, at least. And so it makes the concrete to have, you know, less porosity, uh, less pretrusion to chlorides, less access to the oxygen. And the other thing that we just investigated in this study is difference in the cracking behavior because we know concrete, you know, will crack at some time for drying shrinkage, for loads, for, for everything, for durability problems. And the main difference in this material's main contribution other than, you know, less permeability can be different cracking behavior as well. Because if you get very small cracks, as we did in the UHPC, so those cracks probably get easily blocked by the corrosion products or the salts and, you know, uh, basically, you know, the corrosion performance changes compared to the normal concrete with big cracks. It's like kind of uncracked concrete. Uh, Actually, I just recently saw the, how they finished the UHPC. In the lab, is really difficult. For example, when you cast nine beams and you want to finish them one by one, probably the last one is hard. You need to, again, you know, remove the surface and put. But in the field, I had the chance to see uh, a few months back in the Rutgers University, in the BEAST project, I don't know if you know about that. They have completely, a, 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 you know, a setup for finishing UHPC, you know, it's completely different. A lot of you know tools that are specifically designed for finishing UHPC, and yes, they they get a really nice finish. <laughs> this one was for this one was in the lab temperature, so basically you know everything that's in the lab. But the project that they finished the the you know the the deck, I think. Something like that, something like 80 or 
or so because it was in the summer. For UHPC? Yeah. We do the same. If you do some kind of other curing, like in the high temperatures, with the steam, you will get more, uh, more compressive strengths, probably better durability. But because we cannot do that, you know, in the project, or it's really hard and expensive, so we just tried it with the normal curing regimes that we use for other concretes. Yes. So, um, I hate to, to interrupt. We do um, have to get to our, our next couple of speakers, though. Um, so I'm sorry to jump in. I'm sure afterwards we can continue these discussions as well. But I want to say, say thank you again for taking the time to share your research with us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And I will um, be introducing our next speaker, uh, Rajar Barhimit from the Stevens Institute of Technology. Rajar graduated from Semnan University with a Master of Science degree in Structural Engineering. Her Master of Science thesis was about the behavior of reinforced concrete moment frames with steel plate shear walls under near fault and far fault ground motions. And she is now currently studying for her PhD at St Stevens University of Technology in Civil Engineering, focusing on developing machine intelligence algorithms for intelligent, resilient, and sustainable infrastructure, topology optimization, and computational design for manufacturing. So with that, uh, Rajar, feel free to take it. Hello everyone, my name is Rojiar Barhemad. I'm a PhD student from Stevens Institute of Technology. The title of my presentation is the design of Lego Inspire reconfigurable modular blocks for automated construction of engineering structures. My PhD advisor is Dr. E. Bao, and this is a collaborative research with Dr. Victor Lee from University of Michigan. I did the research uh, at a Smart Infrastructure Lab uh, at Stevens Institute of Technology. Our lab um, has, uh, is at waterfront of Hudson River and faces the midtown of Manhattan. The lab has facilities for large-scale structural testing and high-performance computing and structural health monitoring. Modular, 
First, I would like uh, to briefly introduce modular structures. Modular structures consist of several parts. The parts are fabricated off-site and rapidly installed in the field. Modular structure has many benefits, such as accelerate construction process, reduce labor expenses, and increase quality and safety. And here we can see uh, the examples of modular structures that they are fabricated off-site and installed in the field. This slide shows a new paradigm of modular structures named Lego Inspire Structures. This concept is uh, inspired by Le uh, Lego toys that kids are used to assemble various structures such as bridges and buildings, as we can see in these pictures. Also, reconfigurable modular structures can be easily connect connected and disconnected without damaging the blocks. For example, in this picture, as we can see here, these blocks uh, are used to uh, for assembling a bridge, then they disconnected and reused for assembling a build, uh, frame. This slide shows advantages and current challenges on a Lego Inspire structures. Lego Inspire structures can improve sustainability and resilience and improve construction efficiency and productivity. Moreover, can reduce the adverse, adverse impact of construction on the environment. Also, there are some challenges on the design of Lego Inspire structures. For example, there is a lack of knowledge about the computer-aided design and modeling of modular blocks. Also, it is unclear how the modular blocks should be designed to improve the mechanical performance of modular structure while minimizing the volume. This study aims to address this limitation by developing a data-driven framework to predict the mechanical properties of Lego blocks and design the Lego inspired structure. Specifically, a machine learning models were developed to predict the load capacity, stiffness, and deflection. This slide shows the framework of this study that is established in six steps. First, experimental tests were conducted to determine which kind of loads control the failure of the Lego structures. Next, the experimental models were simulated on Abacus, and uh, the result of a simulation were validated with the result of experimental models. Then we generate a data set using high fidelity finite element analysis. In the next step, using developing data set, we generate a machine learning model to predict mechanical, uh, mechanical properties of Lego inspired structure. Then we evaluated, evaluated uh, the predictive model. In the next step, using the predictive model, we define a many objective optimization to op obtain the optimal design of Lego blocks. This slide shows the initial design of Lego blocks. In this study, a set of four types of Lego blocks was selected as the, design, as the initial design for the experimental and optimization process. As we can see in this uh, picture, we can see that each uh, block consists of uh, four joints uh, on two sides. And also on one side, there are two male shear keys and the other side, there are two female shear keys. In this study, two types of unit assemblers were designed to investigate the behavior of Lego structure under bending and shear force. A specimen one, is under flexural load and a specimen two is under shear force. 
Both assemblages were made using engineer cementitious composite or ECC, and they were tested under three-point bending. During the experiment for the specimen one, the first crack was uh, appeared at the web plate, and when the, we increased the displacement, multiple cracks were generated at side place, plate, as we can see here. And for a specimen two, the first crack was appeared at web plate, and when we increased the displacement, some cracks were appeared um, on the site uh, plates. After the experimental testing, uh, we simulated experimental models on abacus. Here we can see the simulation details. A specimen 1 and a specimen 2 were modeled using 8 node solid elements or C3DHR. Contact between blocks were modeled by surface to surface hard contact. And also, the behavior of concrete was modeled using concrete damage plasticity or CDP as shown in this table. The result of abacus models were validated with the result of experimental models. Here we can see that in these two middle pictures, the failure pattern of a specimen one and a specimen two on abacus. We can see that the failure are uh, the same as uh, failure in an experimental model. As we can see, the crack are at the same place as simulation models. Also, in do these two pictures, we can see the load displacement curves of simulation and experimental models. We can see that load displacement uh, curve for simulation models are in a good, uh, has, uh, have a good agreement with the experimental models. As a result, we can say that the abacus models can accurately predict the behavior of experimental models. So we can use these uh, models for the design process. Also, when we see these two pictures, we can see that the load capacity for a specimen one is about 20 kilonewton, and for a specimen two is about 400 kilonewton, which is the load capacity for a specimen one is much lower than a specimen two. It means the flexure. Occur, uh, the flexure failure occurs first. So the specimen one controls the failure of assemblage. As a result, uh, we choose a specimen one for the optimization process. In this step, we, uh, this slide shows the pro, uh, process of generating a data set using uh, high fidelity final element analysis. The design variables such as H, W1, W2, T1, 2, T3, as shown in these pictures, are considered as input variables, and output variables are obtained from finite element analysis. After generating a data set, this data set divided to two subsets, initial data set and validation data set. After generating a data set, we develop a machine learning model. We use a sequential target model to develop a machine learning model. The sequential target model is a type of supervised machine learning that can replace complicated computer simulation. The process of uh, the sequential target model is shown in this picture. As we can see here, the red curve shows the real function, and blue dots shows the initial data set that we generated using finite element analysis. And black curve shows the target model that should predict the actual function. The sequential sar the target model can approximately estimate where is uh, the highest error. For example, here, dictate this point. And uh, 
the target model gave us at this point and we simulate this point on abacus and add this point to the data initial data set as we can see here when we add a new sample to the data set the target model can accurately predict the actual function This three uh, picture shows the prediction values versus actual values for load capacity, deflection, and stiffness. As we can see in this picture, we can see that prediction values has a good agreement with actual values. This slide shows the prediction accuracy we use to prediction performance metric, coefficient of determination R square error and root mean square error or RMSE. We can see in this table R square error for the validation data set is more than 0.94. Also it should be noted that validation data set is, was not involved in the tra training process. So we can say that the predictive models has high accuracy and high generalization performance and we can use this predictive model for the design process. This slide shows the accuracy of a performance matrix R square error and RMSC versus in field samples. As we can see here, the accuracy of R square error and RMSC increase with adding a new samples to the data set. And uh, this is converged to a cer certain point. It shows that the number of infill samples are enough to predict the actual function accurately. So here uh, we formulate a many objective optimization so we consider six design variable such as h w1 w2 t1 and t2 and t3 then we consider four objective functions load capacity to be maximized deflection to be maximized stiffness to be maximized and volume to be minimized also we consider one design constraint the maximum mass of blocks is limited to 61 kilogram because we wanted to ensure that the weight of the blocks satisfy the payloads of a construction robot to solve this optimization problem we use a genetic algorithm which iteratively tries to find a better solution this picture shows the process of genetic algorithm the vertical axis is the objective function and horizontal axis are optimization process thus we can see that genetic algorithm iteratively tries to find a better solution which is here Because we use a many objective optimization, the genetic algorithm gave us a set of solution, not a specific solution. To find which solution is the best solution, we use a decision-making algorithm to find the best solution. Here we can see the selected solution by the decision-making algorithm. We can see the optimal design has desired performance why the volume reduce and we can see that uh, the load capacity stiffness and deflection increase 22 percent 199 percent and 11 percent while the volume reduce about 51 percent now the conclusion we can see that the developed models can predict the mechanical performance of Lego blocks with high accuracy and generalization performance. The framework provides an effective solution for design optimization of Lego inspired modular blocks. 
Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Yeah, we want to maximize the deflection and minimize the volume of the Lego inspired blocks. Why we should minimize the deflection? Because we need to uh, maximize the ductility of uh, when we, it, it's not the brittle material, so we want to maximize and be the ductile. Yeah. You're welcome. About 60 data points uh, were generated at first and about, uh, I think, 20 data points added to the data set for training process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All of them were obtained from final element analysis. Uh, yes, the machine learning uh, predict uh, our uh, objective functions like uh, load capacity and deflection. Yeah. Yes. Actually, we use machine learning process for the optimization process because uh, for the optimization, we need uh, multiple data to optimize uh, our design. So we generate a machine learning, then we use these uh, models for the optimization process. Uh, we use experimental data for validation our uh, final element analysis. So when we validate it, so we are free to use final element analysis. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Uh, you mean by we use a machine learning? So, uh, yeah, I know your, uh, but uh, as you know, the experimental testing are so expensive. So when we validate our uh, my, uh, final element analysis, uh, it's much uh, cheaper to use uh, to generate data set uh, using final element analysis. And yeah, because Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, we want to predict for the optimization process. So we need a multiple of, uh, we use uh, machine learning to optimize uh, our uh, design uh, of Lego inspired structure. So that's why we use it. Uh, I know uh, the relation is that we can generate uh, from final element analysis. 
But uh, for the for using uh, the optimization process, we need machine learning to predict and uh, know using uh, machine learning know the relation between input and uh, output. Then optimization can optimize the output uh, of the. For the real, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, no, uh, but uh, we just uh, use uh, the Lego for the bridge, and uh, then we disconnected for the frame. But it's not uh, used for the real structures. But I saw some videos that uh, they use Lego for the real structures. Yeah, uh, they, uh, they connected with the bo uh, bolts and uh, some uh, steel bars. Uh, just let me show. Uh, can you repeat your question? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we, uh, we should uh, investigate that. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, yeah, you're right. Thank you, All right, and up next, we're going to have um, Ashith Marath, who will be presenting on developing electrically heated flexible pavement for self-de-icing application. And Ashith is currently a PhD student at the Center for Research and Education in Advanced Transportation Engineering Systems, CREATES, at Rowan University. He is conducting research on developing electrically conductive asphalt pavements for de-icing application in cold regions. He completed his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from TKM College of Engineering in India in 2017. And he completed his master's degree in transportation systems engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, in 2020. He has research experience in the areas of frost susceptible asphalt pavements, climate change and impacts on pavement performance, laboratory characterization of asphalt pavement materials, and developing computer program tools using multiple program programming languages. So with that, Ashith, you can take it away. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, so myself, Ashish Marath. Uh, so the project is uh, about developing electrically heated flexible pavements for uh, self de icing application. And the project is funded by the Department of Defense. So, as we know, uh, the accumulation of snow and ice over the pavement surface is a major issue faced by the several department uh, of uh, transportation agencies. And uh, if you look at the, I'm sorry, there is some issue with the animation. Can be fixed. So, so if we look at the snowfall accumulation in the different states of United uh, uh, in the country, we can see that uh, almost seventy percentage of the region uh, lies in a uh, in a place where they uh, experience. Uh, 
an average snowfall above 7 inches and it can go as high as 67.3 like in state of Colorado. So the existing uh, methods of uh, snow and ice mitigation is the usage of chem uh, uh, de-icing chemicals or de-icing salts and also uh, there, there is practice of using a mechanical plowing method. So the problem with these uh, techniques is that these are labor intensive and time consuming techniques and it calls for like significant operational delay especially in case of uh, road traffic and also in the aircraft traffic. And there it causes uh, several uh, safety concerns uh, regarding the safety of the pedestrians and uh, travelers and also the operators. And it is also reported that the usage of these chemicals uh, is causing for a deterioration of the payment structure, especially we see in the corrosion of the bridge structures. And it also uh, causes for the contamination of the groundwater and have several uh, environmental Im impacts also. So the goal of this uh, study is to evaluate the efficiency of an electrically heated payment uh, for the de-icing application. So the objective of the study is to first develop an electrically conductive asphalt mixture using different types of conductive additives at different dosages and to construct a full uh, full scale test sections using uh, using a selected asphalt mixture conductive asphalt mixture from the laboratory study and then to monitor the heating and power uh, heating performance and power consumption of each uh, each of these test strip uh, during a uh, he, um, heating event in the typical winter season and finally uh, to evaluate the long-term performance of these tests because we need it to be durable, right? So with the traffic, we need to see like whether it is uh, having the same performance or not. So first, let's move into the design of these conductive mixtures. So we have selected the control mixture as a uh, HPTO mixture, which is typically used in New Jersey. And uh, the NMS, as, you, as we all know, like it is a, a very fine gradation and it is 4.75 mm NMS mixture. And we used a binder PG7622. And this mixture, this SPTO mixture was modified using graphite additive and uh, carbon fiber additive. And the fine aggregate portion in the mixture was replaced partially with the graphite additive. And it was mixed uh, with the asphalt binder and the carbon fiber was added into the mixture while mixing it with the asphalt binder. And the binder content was uh, iterated until the compactor mix achieves a target air volts of 3.5 percentage and you can see at the right the uh, images of a electrically conductive mixture there will be like uh, you can see a glittering image at the cut section this is because of the presence of the graphite flakes and these compacted mixtures was uh, taken to uh, to test the electrical resistivity and the electrical resistivity was measured using a multimeter and to avoid the uh, contact resistance, we have applied a thin layer of graphite on uh, both sides of the compacted mix. And we, if we, when we look at the results of the resistivity, the graph shows the uh, drop in resistivity with respect to different dosage of graphite. So the three series indicates uh, three different types of graphite which varied in their uh, gra uh, size gradation. So we can see here that the uh, graphite C, which was the uh, graphite having maximum uh, maximum particle size, the average size of the particle was around 150 micron. That graphite gave the least electrical resistivity at a dosage of 30 percentage by volume of binder. And to uh, and when we look for the impact of the carbon fiber, we selected uh, the optimum dosage of the graphite for each uh, three different type of graphite and added a one percentage dosage of carbon fiber to those mixers and we can see here that with one percentage carbon fiber the electrical resistivity further reduced to uh, nearly one ohm meter so uh, we concluded that uh, a, a, a conductive mixture with 30 percentage of graphite and one percentage of carbon fiber at a uh, binder content of 8.1 percentage was having the minimum electrical resistivity. So this mixer was further uh, taken to construct the full scale test section. Now let's move on to the construction of the full scale test strips. So the full scale test strips was constructed at uh, um, create, uh, milled off and uh, after the milling step is uh, finished, we have installed 
the steel electrodes over the base layer. So these steel electrodes are a critical component in an electrically heated pavements because this structure gives the potential difference across the conductive, uh, conductive layer. So after the installation of the steel electrodes, we have laid the conductive mixture over these steel electrodes. And after the, after the construction of the conductive layer, an asphalt caping layer was laid using a conventional non-conductive asphalt mixture. So uh, we have constructed three different test strips and out of the three, two were uh, conductive test strips. The first conductive test strip, which was uh, also termed as the Robin strip, which had a one inch thick of conductive uh, asphalt layer, over that a three inch thick of traditional HPTO layer. And the second test strip was constructed using a, con a proprietary conductive material, which was basically a, a mixture of rubberized asphalt and conductive fibers. So that mixture was laid as a thin tack coat layer. It was not a structural layer, it was a thin tack coat layer. And over that layer, we laid a four inch thick of traditional HPTO layer. The, this strip was uh, termed as the heat pave test strips. So finally, the third section was a typical asphalt structure which had which had no conductive property. So now, uh, more on this electrode installation. The, the critical parameter in a, a electrode network is the spacing between the transverse uh, bars because the spacing will decide what is the effective resistance of the conductive layer. So in this study, we have considered two different spacing. For the Robin section, we have considered 12 inch and 6 inch spacing. And the, for the heat pair section, we have considered 12 inch spacing. And we have instrumented each test strip with uh, thermocouples, pressure cells, and asphalt strain gauges. All of the test strip was uh, powered with a 24 voltage output uh, step down transformer. Now let's move on to the performance of these test strips. So to, uh, in order to evaluate the performance, we need to decide how to control the power, uh, the supply of power to the test strip. So we followed two methods. The first method was to run the system manually. That means both the sections were powered at the same time. So, and the second method was uh, by, uh, the power control was uh, controlled by the embedded sensors. Like I have shown the different thermocouples were embedded and based on that, temp the temperature of that thermocouples, we controlled the power supply to the system. So now uh, let's move on to the results of the method one. So this plot shows the surface temperature of uh, each test strip uh, over time while heating. So you can see here that the red color curve uh, indicates the surface temperature of Robin section with six inch electrode spacing. So the trend shows that the six inch electrode spacing has a higher temperature, uh, surface temperature uh, followed by the heat pave section and followed by the Robin 12 inch section. So the difference between the surface temperature of control section that is a dash dot line and the heated section was significant it was around 8 to 9 degree Fahrenheit higher temperature and you can see a sudden rise in temperature after some time this is due to the impact of the sunrise when the, it is very sensitive to the solar flex which is occurring in the morning time and you can see the ambient temperature here has, has dropped very low it is very close to 10 degree Fahrenheit also still the uh, heated section was able to maintain it uh, approximately 10 to 12 degree Fahrenheit higher. And now looking at the surface temperature, how uniformly the temperature is distributed over the surface. So to evaluate that, we have taken the standard deviation of e each thermocouples over the pavement surface. And when we look into the uh, results of the standard deviation, we can see that the standard deviation is increasing uh, a very a high standard deviation is there for the heat pave section. That means that the uniformity in surface temperature was less for the heat pave section, whereas for the Robin section, the standard deviation was less and it, the electrode spacing has a uh, least uh, impact on the uniformity of the surface temperature. Now, uh, a direct comparison between the electrode spacing, that is the Robin section with 6 inch and 12 inch section shows that the 6 inch section had a temperature of uh, around 3 degree Fahrenheit higher than that of the 12 inch section. Now, let us move on to the uh, method 2, which is controlled by the embedded sensor. 
so the the sensor was the sensor we considered was the uh, sensor thermocouple at the base of the asphalt layer so it was uh, programmed such that when the temperature of the base thermocouple drops down to 46 degree fahrenheit the system should automatically uh, start uh, start power, power supply and it should shut down when the temperature of the base layer increases and reach hits 52 degree fahrenheit so uh, let us look for the uh, how when the payment was started the power supply was started so these points in the graph indicate the surface temperature of the payment section when the uh, supply was started here we can see that the uh, heat pay section the blue dots have a uh, lower temperature range that means the heat pay section was started at a very low ambient temperature compared to that of the Robin session. So this means that it was taking more time in the heat pill section uh, to reach a lower temperature. Whereas the Robin section was starting at a higher temperature. That means that transmission of the heat was much faster in the Robin section. Now uh, we have seen that from the method one, we have seen that the Robin six in section was having the highest surface temperature. Now we, we need to evaluate at what temperature ambient temperature this section will perform effectively so for, for example like it is heating the pavement surface up to up to maybe above the freezing point at a ambient temperature of 25 degree fahrenheit will it work at a 10 degree fahrenheit temperature so for evaluating that we have introduced a parameter termed heating time ratio the heating time ratio is calculated uh, as the ratio of two time parameters that is t1 and t2 the T1 is the time period where the heated section temperature, surface temperature was below freezing point and the T2 is the uh, time duration where the control section surface temperature was below the freezing point. So that means that if the HDR value is 100% that means a poor perform heating performance whereas the HDR value close to zero means a better heating performance. Now let us look at the look at the results of this HDR parameter, which is plotted against the average ambient temperature during the heating cycle. So here the significance of this plot is that it can give us an idea about what is the temperature minimum ambient temperature which this test section will perform satisfactorily. So if you look at the heat wave section, you can see that it was performing badly like all almost all the heating cycles. It was having a HDR value of 100 percentage. Whereas when we look at the Robin 6 inch and 12 inch section, the intercept of these uh, lines, straight lines uh, at the X axis gives us the minimum ambient temperature which these sections will be performing satisfactorily. That, that shows that the Robin 6 inch section is performing satisfactorily until a lower temperature of 26 degree Fahrenheit. Whereas that of the 12 inch section was 30 degree Fahrenheit. Now, when we look at the power consumption of these tested, we can see that the Robin section had a least power supply that is around 12 uh, watts per feet square and the Robin 12 inch section has around 6 watts per feet square and the heat wave section was having a considerably high uh, power consumption which is around 20 watts per feet square and the standard deviation shows that it is having a low standard deviation it indicates that the variation in the resistivity across time because we need to remember that this is the average value for a time period of six months so in this duration of time there is no significant change in the resistivity of this material conductive layers that is indicated by a lower standard deviation of the power consumption and uh, let us look at the de-icing event uh, uh, happened during the snowfall event at uh, january 3rd of this year and this was the image from, uh, from the test sections and this was the image at a heating duration of 7 hours and the average accumulated snow depth for that snowfall event was 3.2 inches. So you can see here that on the right side the Robin section has started melting the ice whereas the heat wave and the control section was maintaining the ice as it was. And after a duration of 9.5 hours we could see that the Robin section has almost uh, successfully cleared the surface and whereas the heat wave section had no impact on the melting the ice. So by summarizing the findings of this study, uh, we have ordered the different uh, each test strip based on three parameters. The first one is the surface heating uh, performance. That is the best one was the Robin 6 in section followed by the heat wave and the Robin 12 in section. And the, in case of the uniformity in surface temperature, Robin 6 in section was again outperforming other two sections. And the power consumption was the highest for the heat wave section. 
and the, the heat wave section so we have seen from the power consumption that the heat wave section was having a higher power consumption that means it is generating more heat but where is this heat going actually so it could be the higher thickness of the top layer asphalt layer which we laid for the heat wave section and the power consumption as you see like it was significantly higher for the heat wave section and the robin section had showed a effective deicing performance by taking around 10 hours of heating for a snow uh, depth of 3.2 inches so by concluding uh, we could say that the design of is regarding the design of eca mixture it is better to use a combination of fibrous and the powder uh, conductive additives like graphite and carbon fiber uh, rather than using a single type of uh, conductive additives and in case of ease of construction the uh, compared to the heat wave material that is a proprietary material the robin mix is better because it can be laid using a conventional paving machine but in case of the uh, proprietary material it was laid using like manual work it was manually done it was too much time consuming process and the major construction challenge we uh, faced was the formation of the fiber clumps which was resulted as a uh, as the formation of the hot spot during heating because of the uh, non-uniform electrical resistivity and the impact of electrode spacing was shown that uh, it has less impact on the surface uh, temperature uniformity and the heat uh, in, in terms of heating efficiency the EC, ECA mixture performed better because it has a less power consumption compared to that of the uh, proprietary material and we recommend a uh, higher voltage because in this study we have used a 20 voltage power supply but for a uh, low, for a colder ambient conditions we recommend a voltage higher than 20 voltage and uh, the uh, control of the power supply based on the thermocouples was not uh, not good for uh, comparing two test strips because because of the change in the thermal conductivity due to the conductive mixtures and the other factors to consider are the thermal conductivity of the conductive layer and also the thickness ratio of the asphalt capping layer and the conductive layer so uh, currently the uh, hvs is uh, running on the test strips and to evaluate how the uh, how the resistivity is changing with respect to like uh, application of the track loads so that's all i have today thank you for your attention and please free free ask to questions Yeah, so that's a great question actually. So the major reason was that uh, we were concerned about uh, the reflective cracking because we were using the steel electrodes, right, or the base layer. So if we give a, we need a premium mix, which is like very uh, resistant against the reflective cracking. So that is the main reason which we go for the HPTO mixer. And another reason is that the HPTO mixer design airboard is much less. It is 3.5 percentage design airboards. So we have seen from the literature that if the air void content is higher, then the resistivity value will be higher. So we needed to keep the resistivity value low. So that is another reason for taking the HPTO mixer. Yeah, so uh, the power consumption is a is one of the challenge actually because the, the, we need to remember that this is a 30 feet length into 15 feet wide test strip. So if we go for a uh, wider wider and longer test strip such as the air strips or something like that, so the power consumption is going to be high. So in that case, it is a concern we need to do some cost analysis and compare it with the conventional methods and in terms of like especially in terms of like air fields and like the runways and all those so there the uh, benefits to the like uh, economic benefit will be comparable in case of this but but in terms of like the highways like it is uh, difficult because it is not intended for a like full stretch highways because the power as as you said the power consumption will be very high in that case but it can be so in the application for the critical structures like for example like uh, a airstrip so that can be one place and another place can be the bridge uh, decks so such that not for a long stretch if we go for a long stretch the power consumption will be high and even if we are giving a low voltage like 20 voltage in case of the safety it is fine but the current flow was will be, will be very high so the 
cable size will be like significantly higher required for that current to flow. No, actually, uh, so in, in this case, we have experienced like complete meltdown, actually. It, it was like if we give a camber, we have given a slight side slope. So in that case, it will, the melted water will completely go down to the sides. Uh, can, can you repeat the question again? So you said it's for brick applications, right? Um, so we have the brick that runs the service port that also has low reflection, has with reflection crash uh, resistance. Is that ever considered at all to be used? Uh, not as of now, because I have said an, a possible application in the bridge lines. But this was not intended for, like, as of now, it is not intended for that. But it can be used there also. Yeah, so uh, in, in case of the second strip, that is a proprietary material, if we give a one inch thick of HPTO layer, that will again uh, cause concerns about the electrode bars which is placed. So the electrode bar, which is stiff material, will be just below a one inch thin thick layer of asphalt. So we needed to give a sufficient thickness so that the reflective cracking should not appear at the surface. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so th that is a question. Like for with the HVS uh, application, we are not expecting like much rutting or like cracking in this, uh, uh, like major cracking in the section because we know that the PCC base is there below that. Like the thick aggregate base uh, sub base layer is there. So the whole point of HVS is to evaluate the cracking in the. Uh, asphalt layer, conductive layer especially, is that cracks uh, impacting the resistance? Because if it if it uh, ha has impact on the resistance and we are implementing this section and it, if it is not durable, the resistance is uh, going higher with the time, then it will be a major loss. So we need to evaluate the durability. So that's why. And for your question, like the, for the, in the next phase of this study, we will be uh, implementing a completely flexible section in Alaska, which have a like much colder temperature also. Any other questions? I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is practical interest. Um, when you put that one inch chamber, I mean, it's a good, good, good application. I mean, this concept and everything. Um, when it comes to uh, resurfacing again, okay. you know, how would you go about? Have you thought about like you know um, how how will it be easy to remove all those electrodes? Like you know, you don't want the need. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question, actually. So currently, we have not thought about like rehabilitation because this is like we need to evaluate whether this concept conceptually it is good, like it will work. But we need to see like whether it will work on a new laid pavement. So that's right. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you.